is Andrew Waterhouse. I'm the director of the Robert Mondavi Institute and professor of theology. It's my privilege to welcome you to a winemaker's perspective on genetic diversity. This is the second in the new UC Davis lecture series called Forum, which talks on food and wine sciences. The Robert Mondavi Institute was created to provide a forum for exchange of ideas on food and wine particularly with the Departments of Viticultural Ecology and Food Science and Technology. Both departments are very highly ranked, and this is about viticulture, so I'll brag a little bit. Viticulture and Ecology is the highest ranked program in the U.S., actually in the world, in terms of research productivity. And I don't have to remind you that UC Davis is number one in agriculture. As a public university, we pursue a mission of excellence in education and research across the full spectrum of disciplines and all professions for the benefit of California and the world. But part of our mandate is to disseminate knowledge and foster dialogue with other experts and the public through events like this one. At the RMI, we feel it is important to enhance public understanding of wine and food science by being involved in exchange of ideas. This evening's topic highlights a critical but often overlooked effort by UC Davis and many academic institutions to preserve collections of plants, animals, microbes, and even insects for their genetic traits that could be valuable today or in the future for creating new cultivars or strains that we will need to support our food system or in fact nature itself. To highlight the value of these, these collections, you might not be aware of it, but UC Davis holds a special day, Biodiversity Museum Day, each February. Today, though, we we're focusing on a collection of Vita species, largely vinifera. Luckily, we have a very important collection um, managed by the USDA at Wolfskill called the National Clonal Germplasm Repository. Some of you visited that this afternoon. Aside from grapes, Wolfskill includes a wide array of Mediterranean tree and, and vine crops. This topic is, is of particular interest to us because it reflects our institutional priorities investing in the future and leverages our strengths in genetics, plant physiology, breeding, and farming. We're committed to addressing the challenges that face our society and planet, and these collections are an important foundation for addressing those challenges. This evening, we can look forward to hearing how genetic diversity can be important. Our first speaker is Beth Forrestal. She's the newest member of the faculty of viticulture and immunology. In fact, her appointment actually will not begin until July 1. She's a faculty member of the <laughs> She received her bachelor's in biology from Cornell and her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Yale. She then did a postdoc at Harvard with Elizabeth Wolkovich and subsequently came to UC Davis with her own NSF fellowship, where she's been working with Andy Walker and Andrew McNamara. Her work has addressed understanding the genetic, functional, and phenological basis of climate responses in wine grapes. With climate change on our doorstep, this understanding is of great importance. Please welcome Dr. Forsyth. Thank you, Andy. So, I know the title of this event is The Winemaker's Perspective on genetic diversity, and I am the prelude to the winemaker's perspective. It's a little less sexy to say an evolutionary ecophysiologist's perspective. So um, I'll be talking to you about my research and the relevance and importance of germplasm. So a collection, living collections to my research and to viticulture at large. So this is actually the largest, this image here is actually a picture of the largest collection of vinifera accessions in the world, it's Domaine de Vassal, where I spent some time in southern France. It's also all on its own rootstock because it's close enough to the ocean and it's sandy enough soils, so it's not infected by phylloxera, but because of raising sea levels and other issues, they're actually moving all over 5,000 accessions inland to Peche Rouge currently. But it's actually an amazing grounds for doing research and looking at genetic diversity within vinifera. So, also not being a winemaker, I get to start with the sobering news. I'll have a few slides of sobering news and then we'll drink wine later. So, you, most of you probably read in the news in the past 
week or so, this intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services that just came out from the UN. Um, and there's this very intense statement that was made saying that one million plant and animal species are at risk of extinction over the coming decades, which is really striking. There's four million plus known species. That's nearly a quarter of them all. Um, and what I think is unfortunate, though, about this press is that, first of all, I think there are silver linings, which has been out there, but also there isn't enough focus on the plant side of it oftentimes. You see in the National Geographic these charismatic pandas or other species, and it's really plants. This is an image of the Kirsch, from the Kirstenbosch Botanical Gardens um, in Cape Town, which is one of the most diverse botanical gardens, and the Table Mountain here has some of the most diverse ecosystems and important plants. And so when we think about plants, there's an estimated 21% of all species that are likely threatened as well. And we don't even know for most of them because we're still discovering plant species. And I should say we should also think about microbial and fungal species. But for now, today we'll talk about plants. So I'm very interested in preservation of crop genetic resources. And I think about it from a genetic and an evolutionary perspective. And so what really got me interested in this is my background in cooking and food, but also my interest in botany. And so I was really have been struck by seeing statistics like that 75% of genetic diversity of agricultural crops have been lost in the last century. And this isn't surprising when you think about the homogenization of agriculture. And even when you see things that you think may be diverse, it might just be one or two cultivars that's planted. Um, and my mission, both in my research and my outreach, is really to present this idea that this diversity is going to be absolutely critical to cope with changing climate and disease pressures. And so first, I'm going to start broadly. Um, I have a history working with all seed plants as well as grasses. And now I'm working with grapes. Um, this is my bread and butter phylogeny. So this is just a modeled, this is a model of relationships between all seed plant species. And so I use molecular data and I model it to depict relationships and do analyses from there to understand the evolution of physiological tolerances. And so this is actually a phylogeny that I put together from a compiled list of all species that are food sources. And so this is something that's actually a teaching tool called Phylofeast that I've developed. And I also use it for outreach. Um, these are the largest families that you'd see for all food sources. So Poaceae, the grasses, Rosaceae, a lot of our, stone, our fruits come from there. Fabaceae, uh, soybeans, asters the umbels, and then the mint family. These are the largest. Um, and as of right now, even though I would say this is a gross underestimation, underestimation uh, greater than 10% of these are on the red list. So the IUCN red list is a list that goes through and looks at whether species are threatened based on their past ranges and where they are now. Uh, and, but the thing that's really exciting is now they have a crop they have an effort to look at crop wild relatives specifically with the IUCN. So they're evaluating all crop wild relatives. But actually even establishing a list of those is challenging in and of itself. So when we think about homogenization, there's really only five crops that constitute a huge portion of production. And four of them constitute over 75% of our global caloric intake. And so that is, for the caloric intake, it's Sugarcane is one of the highest producing crops, but it's not in terms of caloric intake. But corn, wheat, rice, so we're really heavy on the grasses and then soybeans as well. And so the real question is, with things changing so quickly, what do we need to adapt to? And I'm going to be thinking about California specifically when we think about this. And Obviously, drought and reduced water availability is a huge issue, and it's a huge um, push right now for governmental agencies, state and national, to really understand how we can use less water for agriculture and viticulture included. Um, with that, increased salinity goes hand in hand if you think about Salinas Valleys and other areas that are being salinized. So warming, yes, average temperatures are going up. 
my interest when it comes to thinking about warming is, warming is really the danger of heat extremes. So we think about average temperatures increasing, advancing phenology, but what about when the temperatures get so hot that plants no longer function anymore? And so you actually see these issues where they halt in their physiological development or in their chemistry. This is really critical in grapevine, 2017, in Napa in September, you actually saw bricks stop. And so you had to stop this with the heat waves. You didn't actually get accumulation of sugars because the plant was shutting down. And then lastly, thinking about shifts in pest and disease pressures. This is due to coevolutionary dynamics and then also changes in terms of what pests are able to take over with changing climates as well, which is having a huge influence. So this we're all very familiar with. This is just a cartoon showing the drought from 2011 to 2017. And look at California and where a lot of our agriculture is in the Central Valley. So that is what we've really seen in terms of extreme drought recently, since the Dust Bowl probably. But we also now know that from several models that this is not going to be, this will probably be more normal. We have projected very intense, intense droughts coming in the coming decades. And so this is just looking at different drought indices and soil moisture. And where we're gonna see the most potential for drought is going to be in the Southwest and the Central Plains. These are agricultural hubs. And so this is really an important issue. And as well, I was talking about heat waves. So there are different ways we can define heat waves, but just looking merely at above, at days above 38 degrees Celsius, that's 100 Fahrenheit. And grapevine, you get much above that. You get above that, you really start losing some key functions. Uh, so this is current. Up is up top is Cal oops, up top is California, all of California, and this is Napa, and this is across several excuse me several different models. And you can see there's this drastic increase. And I should mention the scale here is from zero to 180. Down here it's up to 50. But even within Napa, you have areas that are getting up to. 40 days potentially where you'll have that many over 100 degrees. And that is something we really need to think about. So this is really the crux of what I'm talking about tonight is the importance of germplasm collections for climate and disease adaptation. And so my postdoctoral fellowship was actually focused on using national and international germplasm collections. Um, and so what better place to come than the Wolfskill Experimental Orchards, which some of you came to today. Um, it's the most diverse collection of grapevine uh, genetically in the world. And it's probably one of the largest. I know in combination with the Geneva Agricultural Station, they probably have the greatest amount of diversity. China also has a lot, but we are not privy to that material, unfortunately, for living collections. And then also, um, for my work in vinifera, I've worked largely at Domain de Vassal, which is the site that I spoke about earlier, which has the greatest diversity of vinifera cultivars. And then also, you cannot, so I stand on the shoulders of giants when I come into the viticulture department. Omo, um, Andy Walker, you are walking into a situation where you have some of the most amazing material to work with. It's a dream. You do not. He has accessions, 800 accessions from the Southwest or more that are planted out in vineyards and that you can access and study. And now in, with Dario Cantu and others doing the genomics work, there's really phenomenal resources. They're sequencing 800 genomes of very diverse germplasm collection. And it's actually, Peter Cousins is also someone from the germplasm side that I was elated to see here who's contributed a lot and I have lots of specific questions for about what I'm working with. Um, so it's just really amazing the history here and what we have. So briefly Vitus, it is a clade of 60 to 70 species depending on what you define as a species. It's notoriously difficult because they're all hybridizing in nature. Um, it's really split between North America, it originated likely in South America and then moved up into North America and you get this circumpolar movement of species. There's quite a few species 
or clades like that, but it's actually pretty rare to have preserved the diversity that you have in North America. Because of glaciation, you often lose a lot of the diversity for some of these temperate, this is a temperate woody perennial. And so you have really high diversity in Asia, usually, typically, and less so in North America. But in this case, there's been huge preservation, and a lot of that has to do with having a lot of diversity. This is like oaks um, in Mexico and the Southwest. Um, and having these pockets of pres preserved areas. Uh, so tonight I'll talk to you about the use of germplasm for two parts of the grapevine. So if you were to walk through a vineyard and it was pre-suckering, you might be surprised if you use your botanical acuity and awareness. So if you look at this picture, there's something a little strange going on if you thought this was a single species. And that's that you really have very diverse morphology. So this looks like a grapevine that you'd see. This is really weird. And you're not going to see that in vineyards. And it's because you have your scion and your scion, which is vinifera. Vinifera, which is an Asian species, derived from Asian species. And then this is actually a cross of Rupestris and Berlandieri. So those are North American species. And the reason why you see that is because of the phylloxera crisis. So if you go out and look at, there, there's amazing maps in history of how much documentation there is. This is from 1882. This is a map that the French put together of the movement of phylloxera through the country. It was an economic crisis. They had vineyards wiped out. It really changed a lot just due to this small bug that they still are very bitter about it having come from us. It's a North American bug, and they will make comments, and they are, in, in all seriousness, still upset about phylloxera. But it did wipe out tons of vineyards, and actually the highest hectare of vineyards is still from that pre-phylloxera period in France. So what people did is come collect in North America to get resistance to phylloxera and then also get other characteristics which would enable them to grow vine or to grow their plants and they started grafting onto rootstock vinifera onto rootstock the one thing that i think is really important to mention this came from uh, andy walker's lab in our department is that in actuality if you do sequencing and you look at markers across a broad range of rootstocks that are used today they really have a very narrow genetic basis and it's really three accessions that account for nearly 40% of all the genetic content in rootstocks. And you can see this is, this is the percent of material that's represented across this huge set of rootstocks, including some wild species. And this is just a structure analysis, so it's showing you genetic structure of really, it's the riparia, rupestris, and berlandieri. And there isn't that much diversity present within rootstocks currently. So we really have to think about how, and there aren't that many rootstocks used in viticulture today. So my approach to thinking about this in terms of disease resistance and climate tolerance has been, okay, we have these amazing collections. I spent the last year and a half surveying them, looking at their phenological diversity. Vita, vinifera or wine grapes, they're hermaphroditic. All the rest of the wild species are not. There's male, male plants and female plants. So I've taken interest in collecting 54 genotypes from Wolfskill Geneva and from um, Annie Walker's collections that represent a ton of diversity. I've classically studied leaf morphology, but I'm also thinking about the whole plant now and working with Andrew McElrone and people like Megan Bartlett, who's another new faculty here, which is super exciting to have her a part of the department too. Um, and I spanned the entire, so again, a phylogeny. This is the relationships between not all, but most of the species that I'm working with and how much diversity there actually is. Um, and what I've done is I've planted this in an actual experimental design out at the Tyree Vineyard, so out by Bee Biology Road and by the airport, where I can, in replicated fashion, actually see in the field how these are responding to drought tolerance. So there's 10 replications, there's about 500 vines, and I can use differential irrigation. And in addition to that, I'm working with colleagues at um, the University of Michigan, or Michigan State 
to look at growth defense trade-offs as well and the phylosphere. So there's really remarkable defense traits in Vitus, especially the Asian species. Um, so this is just to show you those three species that have been primarily used for rootstocks. Uh, there are other rootstocks, and I say, so the reason Rupestris and Riparia were used first because of phylloxera resistance, grafting and rootability. Subsequently, Berlandieri was brought in because of Lyme tolerance. And there are several other species now that have been incorporated. Um, Annie Walker's breeding program with Pierce's disease. Uh, there's another one here too that's very salt tolerant. And I think it's really critical to start using new genomic techniques. I should say this, I just got back all of my full genome sequences for all of these too, so we really have the potential to develop new markers and have a really robust system to work with to develop tolerance and climatic tolerance and disease tolerance. And I should say too, again, these Asian species here are largely the ones that have enabled us to develop powder or to find powdery mildew resistance. And another reason why I think about this comparatively in an, an evolutionary context as well is because what it enables you to do is do comparisons and see how distantly related are these species where we find resistance or tolerance. And then we can begin to stack traits and see if there are different mechanisms driving these tolerances or these complex phenotypes. So thinking about things in terms of heat tolerance, there are a lot of species that either are cold adapted across the phylogeny or adapted to warmer climates. Um, in terms of precipitation or aridity, the same is true. And this is something I'm particularly interested in what characters, whether it's drought tolerance, Andy Walker doesn't believe there is a drought tolerant grape that exists, but perhaps drought avoidance, or he thinks it always finds water. But there is probably, there is definitely a varying degree of drought tolerance. And then if there are other root traits or other aspects, um, this is also something that Megan's doing some really awesome work on developing new techniques to, to look at this, which is exciting. So I look at this in an evolutionary context. Um, I've done a lot of work, as I said, with looking at leaf function. And so I'm also looking at the interior structure of leaves and seeing how water use and also at a CO2 enrichment site in Germany, how CO2 increases will affect leaf level responses in these plants. And so now thinking about scion diversity. So that's a lot of what we can bring into the rootstocks. So Vitus vinifera, vinifera is what has yielded all of our genetic diversity in wine grapes. And this is actually a image from Dan Chitwood's work that you probably may have seen before of all the different leaf morphologies across the vinifera collection at Wolfskill. And it's really quite amazing for several reasons. There's tons of diversity in leaf morphology and traits. Um, and there's also a ton of varieties of wine grapes or table and wine grapes. So there are 24,000 named, but they're slowly chipping it down because now they're able to assess whether they're genetically distinct. So there's probably closer to five to 8,000, but they vary a ton in well, it just doesn't have this. These actually vary a ton in several weeks in terms of their phenology or development. And it's a tool we can use, this phenological diversity, to adapt to climate change too. Um, this is just, so this is a report of all what has been, all that has been planted across the world in 2013. It's this amazing compilation coming out of Adelaide, I believe, that an economist put together whereas the acreage of every variety planted across geopolitical regions in the world. And so I took data from Domaine de Vassal. We recorded all of these phenology records and looked at for maturity. And this is the maturity timing based on bricks for varieties that were all grown in the same place. So this is all in Southern France. And there is over two months of diversity in that timing. And some of these varieties surely are not particularly suitable for wine, but there's some that are phenomenal. And what's interesting is that if you think about it in terms of what is planted where, we already plant later harvest, later varieties in warmer regions. 
So you can see in southern France and in warmer regions and in Bordeaux or in southern California, we're already making that link between later varieties and climate. And I think we need to think about that more broadly in terms of matching other components of ge genetic diversity or um, tolerance. So again, my briefly sobering news in terms of thinking about diversity, there's the international varieties um, like Syrah, Chardonnay, Cabernet, Riesling, um, Sauvignon Blanc, the list goes on. If you look at wine regions around the world, 10 varieties constitute greater than 40% of wine hectorage globally. And these are the usual suspects, probably not Iran you're less familiar with in Spain, but these are all ones we know. And there are several varietals that are of amazing quality and are really exciting, some of which Steve will show us today, um, that we should be thinking about. And I should say this is from 2013, and this is progressively getting more homogenized as well. So when we think about California, the same thing. Actually, there's no change in diversity of varieties, so there's several, there's several varieties that are planted across California, but from what, 1976, if you look at the crush reports up to 2015, you see this major jump in Cabernet, Chardonnay, Zinfandel. Um, and I just like to point out two potential cultural influences. So the judgment of Paris is, of course, when Stag's Leap won for um, Cab. And I'm totally blanking on who the vineyard for. Yeah. OK, thank you. And then I always like to mention I don't know, always know who's in the audience, but I always like to mention that the wine advocate came out during that time, which largely may have had a pretty significant influence. And it's where I like to point out that there are a lot of cultural aspects to these patterns that we see as well. So I'll move a little more quickly now. So briefly, this is just an illustration of looking at some of the international varieties. So the international are in red, this is Chardonnay and Cabernet. And then another suite of varieties, more diverse suite of varieties are in blue and showing that we really actually have much less diversity functionally. So this is for phenology. This is a metric for water use is that some of our species that actually may use water more efficiently or some of the cultivars that might or those that are later ripening that may be able to adapt to warmer climates are being underutilized. And a portion of my work, both at Vassal and at Robert Mondavi Institute has been to look at these relationships. So delta C13 is just a proxy for water use at the end of season. It's often measured in berries. I've usually done it with leaves, but in viticulture it's measured in berries. And there is, albeit a very, a slightly messy one, there is a relationship across 50 wine and table grape varieties that are very diverse in their biogeographic origin between things like phenology. So flowering day of year, variation day of year, and thinking about how we might be able to couple different, um, different tolerances or maximize what these plants are able to tolerate. Uh, and I'm working on also incorporating thinking about the chemistry too with one of Andy Waterhouse's students and seeing how some of these physiological traits and phenological traits might relate to berry chemistry as well. So in addition to all the diversity that I'm thinking about, um, I'm also working with industry, and I think this is really critical to actually be able to make these leaps for what you see in the wild species to what is practical in industry. And I'm thinking a lot about heat waves, as I said, and so using variable rate drip irrigation systems in areas where it's one or two cultivars, and this is in Lodi, and this is working with Gallo. I'm manipulating, I'm using remote sensing and then ground-based physiological measurements to see when you manipulate the amount of water you use before a heat wave. So typically, and I haven't heard much else in terms of standards, growers will dump water on when it's really hot. They don't know how much, they don't know exactly why, they see the forecast, they dump it on, and sometimes it can be in much excess of what perhaps would be needed in terms of plant performance, and it might actually hurt the plant. And so you do it for, transpirational, evapotranspiration and cooling, um, but it might not be the best to do as much as what they're doing. And so I'm working with industry to try and figure that out and see if we can have more sustainable practices in terms of water use. 
And so just to recap, um, I really do think that at Davis and beyond, we have amazing, amazing resources and they should be protected and leveraged and talked about and go, I, even for seeing some of these, like go out to go out to the Tyree vineyards or if anyone wants to see all the wild species, there's really truly amazing diversity and I think promoting it and um, studying it is critical. And then also too, in terms of thinking about enhancing resilience of viticulture, of the viticulture and wine industry, is so I start first with my botanical eco-evolutionary perspective of preserve and protect diversity and study it so that we can use it, but also critically to communicate to industry and the public and for you to be open to new varietals and new experiences and maybe even sometimes thinking that wild species can be thrown into the mix with your wine, maybe. So I was a little long, but with that, I'd like to thank all of my funders and my collaborators, and thank you so much for having me here. I'm very, very honored to be speaking alongside one of the best winemakers out there. Can everyone hear me like this, or should I use the mic? Good, okay. Thanks. It's really great to be back here. It's, um, I, you know, spent three years, really awesome years in this um, wonderland here. Um, you know, um, I um, had spent, I majored in philosophy, and then, because I didn't know what I, the only thing I was interested in was gardening, cooking, and, and thinking, and the outdoors and so major in philosophy because what are you going to do with those interests? So I was living in San Francisco working um, as a bike messenger and really involved with the, with the community gardening um, slug. At, um, it's called the community gardening in um, San Francisco and um, found out my friend had a, had a um, his, my friend's dad had gone to high school with one of the professors here in agronomy, Steve Temple, you know, I remember him, and um, and so he said, "Hey, I'm going to go out and have dinner at his house. Do you want to check out Davis?" And I came out here and was absolutely floored that there was an entire university dedicated to agriculture, and I, I didn't know that ex I didn't know it had it existed, hadn't um, just had been blithely going along, not knowing that there was this giant repository of information just sitting here. So I managed to get into international ag development. Um, and um, was the one program I could get into that I, I could come and learn how to farm, and um, and so I show up and um, and they assign me. Um, um, oh man, this is, 
have a moment here. I just turned 50. I'm not supposed to have senior moments yet. <laughs> um, anyways, um, I'm having a complete blank on the head of the SEREP program because I was interested in organic farming. And um, Bill, okay, I'm going to get there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Bill Liebhart, and, I, and, I say, and he says, what do you want to get out of Davis? Well, I want to learn how to farm. And he says, well, you're going to have to go, go out and work on a farm. Well, um, I guess that's obvious, but again, you know, you're trying to figure these things out. So I, got, so I went out and worked down in, in, um, in Merced for, this, for the BIOS project, which was a sustainability in almonds project that was pretty seminal in California for sustainability in almonds. I met my wife because she was working for CAF, which was at that time was just down Russell, was, was, there was their office before they moved to Glide Ranch. My wife, Jill Klein, and so, um, so she was, had, had helped get the grant for this project. And the co I worked for Four Seasons Ag Consulting out of Merced and um, doing the, mon you know, just gathering data out on the, um, on the almond orchards. And they, but they also consulted on vineyards. And so they, so they would have me go and gather data in the vineyards as well. And everything, and then, but then I was still living here. And so I would come back and, and go to the library and look up what I was learning or go plop down and very, on all the different professors who, who um, you know, annoyed for three years basically and, and talked about what, I, and, it, and this whole like career path bloomed with, because um, I ended up coming back there the next summer and the next summer. And then when I got out, finished my master's degree here, which was kind of a, I ended up switching over from IED to horticulture. Andy Walker was my major professor and, it, and, my, and I just did the, um, Oral, so I could get out and keep working at Four Seasons Egg Consulting, and so is Ted DeYoung in pomology, and Bruce Kirkpatrick in plant pathology, and Andy Walker in viticulture were my orals committee, and that was because it was a, I just kind of cobbled together all these great programs to really get an education in how to be a agricultural consultant in trees and vines, which is what I, what I kept on with at Four Seasons Egg Consulting after leaving here. And, uh, and so, that, so I just really, you know, like going to Wolf Skull Day was a real treat for me because I remember going here, went there when I was a student with Kay Ryugo, who was, I think, emeritus at the time in pomology to go look at persimmons. And, um, and just, you know, again, just going through the library, talk, meeting the farm advisors, you know, um, so many mentors, Doug Goobler, who just passed away. Going, going, I remember going down to the Imperial Valley with him and looking at plant diseases and Bruce Kirkpatrick going, in, going up into the Sacramento Valley and looking at plant diseases in this tradition of horticulture and, and of valuing the repository you know, of knowledge and of all these genetics that have, been, that have been gathered by all these passionate horticulturists that sort of have comprised this place, this aspect of the place, because I don't know what goes on in the art department. <laughs> you know, my world was, you know, Wixen Hall, and so, um, and you know, and so you think about horticulture, and, and it just when people love it, they love it. Like my mom was was in the African Violet Society, and so you know we had all these stands with lights and tons of different African violets, and you know so, with, with, you know if you're into grapevines, the it's the same thing. Um, you have these all these different varieties, but our flower is the bottle of wine, basically. And rather than looking at the flower on the, you know, you make the wine out of it, and that's the flower that that particular vine makes. And these vines are cherished and they're passed along. Um, you know, I, I was looking at the timeline for, you know, 1,000 years of rainfall data, and we have grapevine, wine grape varieties that probably go all the way back to the beginning of that timeline that we're still making wine from. I brought a Rebola Gialla, and that was a variety that was written about in a menu in the 1200s. So it's probably much older than that. And so if you think about the climate changes that have occurred, the socio, social changes, the, all, everything that has transpired, but people valued that plant and took those cuttings and passed it along the entire time. You think about like a sour, family sourdough starter, and if it can go two generations, it's you know, a miracle. And people have helped carry these plants, which is essentially the same thing, for a 1,000 years then it's unbelievable and you think about this, the, the, that it carried value that entire time that to be passed along. And the knowledge, you know, you go back, you go to an art gallery and you look at um, 
like a Renaissance painting that uh, the still lives, and you go, that must be, it looks like a Camille's pear. And, um, and you think, huh, these are, these, like, the tradition of horticulture was pretty developed a pretty long time ago. And, and so we're, you know, the comment of standing on the shoulders of giants, I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of a very long tradition. And so that's why it's so important, you know, to, to be the link. It's one thing all the species are going extinct. I mean, it's just very overwhelming, but narrowing it in and to, and to in, under our watch for a pear variety or a grape variety to, to go ex, to drop out that has been carried forward for a thousand years is just it, um, inconceivable. And so, um, you know, just think about that tradition of horticulture. When we think about, we were just at Wolf Skill looking at the olives and, um, and we we're looking at how big and strong those olive trees are. And uh, Ron is sitting in the front, it looks like crazy how many friends there are. And it's fun to see Cliff over there, the other, other author of the workbook. Yeah, um, but um, Ron was pointing out, oh yeah, well these are missions there more vigorous. And, you, and, then, and just like I remember taking ampelography here at Davis, the mission grape, it was easy to ampel. I, I couldn't tell you the tumescence or the shoot tip or anything on mission because it was just the tail was the trunks were that big around and everything else had a trunk like this. Why, of all the variety, all the grapes in the, the, in the art collection that we looked at, why would mission be the most vigorous, highest yielding grape there? It, it, you know, think about the missionaries coming over, not knowing what in the hell they were going to encounter. So they brought something that could handle anything. How they know that? You know, the only mission that I'm aware of that still you, you still find wine. I have no idea where you can find it in Spain, but it's like the Canary Islands, I think. And so, but they they knew they, that information was there, and some and they knew to bring that that one with them, just like they brought the mission olive, which is strong which you can make oil from, really high quality oil. You can make pickled olives. The mission fig is hard to improve on, the mission fig. And so it's, it's, it's you know, but so, so those are um, varieties that they knew for a long time were great. They, they're still great. We still, you know, have them. They're still in the commodity world. It's, they're not going away anytime soon. But then you look at all these slides that show all the, unexpected climatic changes and then you think well what about the ones that haven't been that people kept along for a long time but they haven't had um, there the value isn't necessarily apparent and so um, so maybe they're going to drop off and then we're going to wish we, we had it when um, you're sitting there in Oakville and the climate's the same as Bakersfield and so um, and they drop off. You know, one of the, I wanted to bring some Schio Patino. You're going to have to come tasting in Napa with us to taste the Schio Patino because I couldn't find the bottles on my way here. But Schio Patino is this variety that we have that um, was down to just like a couple vines on a fence in Italy. And, and so this family has this winery called Ronco Cialla. They're from Friuli, but they were living in Milan. They were sort of Italian version of Back to the Landers in the 70s. And they wanted to do indigenous varietals because Friuli had this big push post-war to do international varietals because they were looking, the government was really pushing for export for dollars and so they were planting Sauvignon Blanc and Merlot and Cabernet Franc, Chardonnay in Friuli. And so Roncocello, they wanted to um, celebrate their heritage and so they um, found the Schio Patino vines and kind of brought it back. But the, the government had actually prohibited for a while to even grow the stuff. So, you know, it was so short-sighted in that sense that we, I mean, short-sighted maybe is a judgment being put on someone, come, a country like that coming out of World War II, but in hindsight, at least keep them in a collection so you can have them later, don't just get rid of the things. So luckily they were able to find them. There's some other Freelian varieties that have been brought back that they found one vine that was in a convent that was, on a, that was just on an arbor. I forget the name of that one. It's, I want to say it's Pico, not Pico, it might be, Similar to Pico Leet, basically. But anyways, so it's a worldwide problem of these varieties kind of slipping away. And, and, and thinking about these, again, these varieties, they're, they're so old. I mean, in grapes in particular, a heirloom with grapes, because these are heirlooms. In, in the language, we think of like an heirloom apple. Like people that are, a foodie knows that an heirloom apple is different than a modern apple. But, 
an heirloom, a lot, most of the heirloom apples are still only a few hundred years old, in, whereas a year, few hundred years old is young for a grape. You know, the, these are heirlooms that go, they tend to be quite old. And so, um, lost my train of thought here for a second. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, so, so, the, so we, we, when we think there's climate, but there's also fashion. And so post-war, they're looking for international varieties that they can export. Um, we saw that chart about Parker, the judgment of Paris. It's interesting just to think in this short period of time, North, you know, California viticulture, we had the missionaries who just wanted to make wine, and so they brought mission. You had post-gold rush, you had a few different threads going on. You had immigrants that wanted to grow what they, they just brought what they tended to grow. You also had prestige. So you had people that made a lot of money, whaling or ship captains type of thing that brought Cabernet over from first growth Bordeaux houses. Um, you know, so Cabernet is not the most practical variety if you are a, um, with these old varieties tend to be very low yielding, shatter, small berries. That's, that's a variety, if it, it take up the same amount of space, it's a variety that is, um, more, you're, 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 you have a, it's a luxury variety, basically, if you're thinking about it as a peasant trying to grow food. It's the polar opposite of mission, basically. So, so they grew, but they wanted to grow, grow their Cabernet. But Phylloxera comes, that was, you know, just like it was unanticipated to, in Europe, it was unanticipated here, just came out of left field, just like glass Evening sharpshooter came out of left field in Temecula. Things, we have the long history of stuff coming out of left field with viticulture. And so, and you, so they dealt with it with rootstocks back to genetic diversity. Um, and there's so many more pests since phylloxera that have come with rootstocks that we're still, you know, as an industry person, we're sitting there looking at the rootstocks coming out of Davis and going, and just waiting for more fan leaf resist, resistance, more nematode resistance. We're looking for drought tolerance without higher vigor. There's, um, there's a lot of, of traits in, that could still come that would be very useful in rootstocks. But... That if you know, you have your riparia, berlandieri, rupestris, and so our suite of rootstocks is basically, um, as a is we have a pretty small little decision tree we go through when we plant a vineyard because you don't have a ton of options. Um, but so phylloxera happens, um, people replant. Uh, it's, it, it, it's more up in the second wave post phylloxera. What are we going to make wine out of? A little bit more immigrant focus is how I look at it, not as a story, but just painted, just kind of looking back. A lot of Charbono and more Zinfandel and things like that, and Prohibition. No one saw Prohibition coming either, and that was a death knell for Cabernet because if you think about the worst grape to, ship, to pack in a box and ship across country, very, it, um, it's a very light grape, cluster of grapes with a lot of air in, inside it. So. You're not going to have a whole lot in that wooden box. And so, but whereas Zinfandel is nice and heavy. So, again, that's another one. We didn't, you, how did you know that this variety we've been hanging around for a long time that makes good wine would be perfect for shipping when shipping wasn't on the radar screen? And Alicante Boucher, how would, how would this color variety that you can stretch wine with, but with add a little water and sugar, put that on the radar screen? It, it, that, that wasn't on the radar screen either, but it was extremely important at that moment in time, and it was that, that we had it enabled a lot of farmers to continue making money growing ship Alicante Boucher. Um, I was thinking about the um, your, your slide where you show the Paris tasting, and but so Warren Winiarski, the reason I piped up into Sicy Wine Cellars, I worked consulted with Sicy Wine Cellars for about 12 years. Well, with Warren Winiarski, partly after he sold Sexy Fine Cellars. So I got a lot of stories from him. He told me that before, that Julia Child, the biggest thing, bigger than the Paris Tasting or the, or the French Paradox was Julia Child's cookbook in the early 60s. Um, before that came out, he, he believed that there was more Chasselas in Napa Valley than there was Cabernet Sauvignon. And so the um, growers were, you know, it was, Chasselas is a high yielding, Easy to grow white grape, and um, and Cabernet is a lower yielding grape. So why would you grow Cab if no one, Nap, Nap, Napa stuff's all getting tossed into one big pot with Thompson seedless and anything else? 
but we had a couple, co we had coincide Martin Ray and and um, there's a there is a fascinating back to UC Davis for a second like so Amarine um, was really important obviously coming out of, of prohibition and and so there were these letters that were written between Martin Ray and Maynard Amarine over like 20 years and it, and so I read them and it was it was published in this Wayward Tendrils which if you're into like old books it's a like a bit old wine book collecting society there the um the Sonoma wine library kind of houses it and so there are letters between Maynard Emerine and Martin Ray and Martin Ray telling a story of trying to get varietal labeling because he was he was trying to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and he couldn't get any respect for it when people are just calling Thompson Seelis Chablis and so so they push so with um Shoemaker, Schumacher in New York, who is, you know, again, the, you know, the trade always is important in the, in the, as important part of the, of the wine world always, always has been. And um, they managed to, and get, got managing list, John Daniels in Napa and get this varietal labeling thing pushed through. Again, not something that the grape industry saw coming, but then it's luckily, lucky that they have varietals that they can use. And so, oh, Cabernet booms, and we look at Cabernet, and so it's, it'd be easy now to say, well, research should be focused on Cabernet because look at the numbers, Cabernet dom dominates the industry. Well, Cabernet has dominated the industry for 50 years, but the Cabernet variety is two or 300 years old, and a lot of the other varieties are 1,000 years old, and so 50 years is a blip. And so it would be insane to not prioritize keeping other varieties around because how long is Cabernet going to dominate? As an Napa Valley producer who makes Cabernet and has one kid in college and one kid on the way, I, I pay a lot of attention to how long Cabernet is going to dominate. <laughs> and it's not for very long, I can tell you that. It, the millennials are not big Cabernet drinkers, it turns out. And so the farm to table restaurants that are important right now don't tend to have a big Cabernet list. They're very interested in unusual and different varieties. They grow heirloom, they have heirloom produce um, on the menu and they want that reflected in their wine list. They want a wine list for people who can discover new things and they're looking for lighter bodied wines that go with the food. It's a complete change of wine style that's happening right now. And so, which is gonna make a lot of what we do in the industry with Cabernet let, a lot less relevant over the next five or 10 years. And so we're seeing um, you know, as a, I, I'm, I'm seeing that just, a, just this massive shift, and, and so, so we, we managed to, we, it was one of those strokes of luck of being positioned in the right place at the right time, but where we, we make a lot of different varieties because that's, I'm passionate about it, but we, we've gone from fighting to sell our other varieties to, and so growing our cab and Chardonnay programs to don't forget about our cab and our Chardonnay. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wish we had more Schio Patino for you, but we didn't think that people would want Schio Patino four or five years ago when, you know, when we could have done something about it. So it's, it's, it's um, the, the, this evolution just keeps going, and that's the genetic, you know, back to the genetic diversity is uh, um, so valuable. Uh, you know, market is just as important as climate, really, because like I watch all the, um, there, there's, there are the, uh, the studies on climate change if, that we won't be, that, um, you know, people, that Napa will become too hot, that people, you know, wineries are literally buying, the, especially the most, the larger ones are buying land in Oregon and buying land up in British Columbia. And, and I'm going, wow, if it's too hot to grow grapes in Napa, who's gonna buy Luxury wine is what I want. You know, I, I think there's a real disconnect there. I think you bend over and kiss your ass goodbye if you can't grow wine grapes in Napa anymore, personally. But we do know it's going to get that. It's that um, in the shorter term, we need it's we need to be able to adapt to that to the to the weather. And um, you know, one of the things we've done at our home vineyards, we planted Sagrantino. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed over the last five years of drought, the nights have been warmer. You know, Napa Valley, one of the selling points was always the diurnal fluctuation. You, they don't sell that as much anymore because 
back to that wine style, the wine style changing as the boomer buying bracket doesn't prize acidity as much. And so pHs have come up as a wine general, and TAs have gone down for wine style. They've become um, broader, softer, plusher wines. But the, so, so, so you don't hear that as much talk. So a lot of, for the, so the modern contemporary style, let's say, of wine, it works that we're having less acidity in Napa and Sonoma because of slightly warmer nights. For us, it doesn't because we make food wine, and so I'm having to pick earlier and earlier and earlier to get that bright acidity. But um, again, as the pendulum swings back, and the millennials that grew up on, on um, sour candy instead of chocolate um, like acidity, and so it's kind of, so we're going to, well, we'll see how the, you know, how, as the, the wine industry is a little like a battleship, you know, but acidity is, is getting important again, and it's a big part of our style. And so is, our, is firmness with our tannins. And so we're planted, we planted Sagrantino as an experiment because it's extremely tannic and, um, and it does well in the heat. There's a variety that, um, so Richard Ripkin down in Lodi um, used to be one of the growing places for Olmo's breeding. And I remember when I was working for the Lodi Wine Grape Commission going and tasting with him because he had his homebrew shed with all his carboys of various things because he was a horticulture nerd also. So he had a bunch of different varieties and one of them was something that Omo had, had grown out there but decided it wasn't going to be commercially acceptable and told him to get rid of it, but he didn't. And so we call the variety Ripkin, but um, it's like, because I went back a few years ago and asked him for some budwood, and we put that next to our Sagrantino. It's a cross between um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Grenache, and Carignan. So I remember Ripkin saying, taste the pencil lead. Uh, um, 3% of this in your cab would taste like Bordeaux. And, um, and pencil lead is one of those elusive things in California because it's too warm. We don't get pencil lead. Pencil lead is a more of a Bordelais character in, with wine. And so, I, you know, so all these years I've remembered the pencil lead. So we got the, we gra grafted it, we got the budwood and grafted it. But that's another thing that's changing is when in, in school, when we were doing epilography, the, it was just a given that Hybrids are forget it. No one wants them in the marketplace. And new varieties, Zweigel, Muller, Thurgel, are a failure, and don't worry about that either. All people want is the classic stuff. So when it, that was one of Andy Walker's frustrations and focus, why he decided to focus more on rootstocks. Well, that's changed. You, know, there's, you can go to probably 11 Madison Park in New York and get Zweigel and, and, and Muller, Thurgel. There, um, you know, the, 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 a lot of things have changed in, that, in terms of the openness to new varieties. I've been paying a lot of attention to the mildew-resistant varieties that are being uh, Andy's working on right now, because we'll, we'll, I'm going to plant them, and I know, and we're going to sell it, and we're going to say new variety, whatever Andy calls it, we'll call it that, Mild and tell the story about it's mildew-resistant. We don't spray this at all, and I, we will sell the crap out of that. You know, there are wine clubs right now that are testing wine. And if it has any pesticide residue, they won't buy it. it being certified organic isn't good enough. They're testing it. Um, Scout and Cellars in Texas has grown in like three years to like several hundred thousand cases based on what they call clean crafted wine. And that, that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of, or the tip of the spear in terms of where the wine market's going with the millennial generation. They don't want pesticides. And so if we can put a wine out there that doesn't have any sprays on it, and it's not Cabernet, it's some variety it's never heard of. It's going to sell, no problem. And, um, and it's going to start changing the conversation yet again. And, people, and we'll think of Cabernet maybe the way we think of Chastolis. Like, what the hell was that? Who knows? It, but it's going to take a while for that to happen. But um, I, I, it's, it's, it's continuing to evolve. And so, so the focus can't just be on Cabernet. Chardonnay, you know, Pinot Noir, et cetera. It was fun looking at the leaves, the Chasselis, Pinot, and Chardonnay, and Cabernet leaves, and seeing that the Pinot leaf was covered with powdery mildew. <laughs> and that shows, you know, because it's a very sensitive variety and it's hard to grow, it, takes, it's, it gets powdery mildew, gets botrytis. It's a very finicky variety. And it's not going to ha handle the heat as well. So it's a lovely variety, but it might. It had, a, it had its moment in time, and it might shrink back down to its more appropriate sites again like it used to be. 
which wouldn't be a bad thing. So um, um, the, the four wines we have back there are, a, there's a blend, which is Sauvignon Blanc, so it's not that in, different, but then Ribola Gialla, which is from Friuli, Italy, and Slovenia, um, Semion, and Friulano. You know, Semion is one that is a white variety that can maintain a lot of freshness in a warmer climate. So I think there's a lot of promise with that one. So it makes a beautiful wine in California, really nice food wine. Um, we have this interesting experience because we have, with our tasting room, uh, people will see little, people won't know anything really about us. They just see a little thing on like the United Airlines little thing or read something or their sommelier says, go see Mathiasen while you're in Napa. And then they're hitting like the Mondavi and Duck Horn and more like your straight ahead Cabernet places. And the, our number one seller is our skin fermented Ribola Gialla, which is um, the other one I'm going to, is I also brought from the white department. So people, you know, there's, you put something good in front of, you know, the, the, the industry, whether on the research side or the production side or even the sommelier wine writer side, I think tends, our experience, we have data, they, they underestimate the general public's palates because, again, we have people and they're Cabernet drinkers and they walk out of there with a really funky 11% alcohol skin fermented white wine because they see the food pairing possibilities and think it's really cool to have something they never tried before. And so, um, so we're, our industry is doing itself a disservice in shrinking the market and the longevity when we pigeonhole and homogenize, in my opinion. So to bring, you know, the, to bring the economics into it, to have, maintain a vibrant, healthy industry, we need to have offerings that people can spend a lifetime discovering and not go, okay, tasted that before, and what are they doing in craft beer? <laughs> you know, or, or craft cannabis. Um, and so, we, so, the other, so, the, so there is a skin fermented Ribola Jala. So that's, the Ribola Jala is a variety that they brought with, that is um, really, really old. And, and so for most of that history would have been fermented with the skins and stems all together without temperature control. And so that's how we did it. And um, it was th these, these cuttings, I wanted to bring, the reason I wanted to bring Schiavatino is because the cuttings were from uh, FPS, which I thought would be very emblematic of this variety collection, but if I couldn't find that. But the Ribola, which those cuttings were smuggled by a friend of mine, even, I, and I told them not to. And, um, <laughs> and so, so um, hopefully it hasn't created any problems, but it wasn't me. And so uh, <laughs> I did tell him not to. But, but um, I did fall in love with it as well, and he got the cuttings from this producer, Grovner, who, um, who decided to switch. His, his son died in a motorcycle accident. He was probably considered the top white winemaker in Italy. He was making very modern style wines, barrel fermented whites and Friuli, and his, after his son died, he, had, he decided he, to go back to his roots, and he imported these clay amphora from Georgia, which still was doing wine in the ground in the am, clay amphora and buried him in, in his cellar in um, Friuli and started making in only indigenous varieties, whole cluster in those clay amphora. And this going back to, you know, the way that wine was made for a long, long time in Slovenia. And, um, and, and we know that I, I, can tell, I can attest that, that whole cluster fermentation was the way wine was done because two years ago when, when we lost power at our winery, the only way we could process our fruit was whole cluster fermentation because you, you can't run a destemmer, you got no power. And you're not going to sit there and pick every single grape off. <laughs> so that's how they did it. And so, um, and so, um, so he started a whole revolution that has been, that kind of has spread out all over the world. Now wine list has sections called orange wine. You know, it's common now to find a restaurant that has an orange wine section. And again, that term was coined like maybe eight years ago because no one knew how to categorize this forgotten wine style that's come back again. And so again, back to this idea of the genetic diversity, because you just do, cannot see what's coming in the wine industry, even though you, if you think of it as a traditional industry, it's not. It really evolves fast. Um, 
And so then there's a, there's, um, a bottle of Ligrain for you to try. So the, the Ligrain was from northern Italy, but uh, um, closer to Austria. And, but it was grown up in the Sierra foothills, of El Dorado County, about 3,000 feet on granite soils with um, you know, pine trees. Um, a really great um, grape for that, that site. A lot, you know, it, it, um, it's not porty like a lot of Sierra foothills reds can be. It's interesting to see what some different varieties can do in different places. And, and then the, um, there's a Rafosco, which Rafosco is um, kind of distantly related, I think, to like Syrah and um, Teraldigo and probably Legrain and that kind of family that moved over. And, um, and we grow that at our home vineyard next to the Rabola, Jala, and Napa. So, um, yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few questions, although if there is one, I mean, but, um, please. Has anybody got a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, it seems to be that um, it needs to be an effort, right? You have like the grower and like the winemaker and the, and the consumer, like to do that like cheap, right? To like be open to other varieties. So. Where do you think we should be reaching the most? When, like, which of these three, or you know, like also like the, the vineyard owners, so which are the ones that we need to educate the most? Uh, mm -hmm. oh, the most. That's a toughie, because every, they, everyone needs to be educated. The the producers, you know, live in fear that they'll get a, that the wine won't sell. Or it's a, such a huge investment, and then and. You don't get a lot of feedback about whether the wine's going to sell until you start selling it, in which case you've already made a bunch of investment. It's, it's not like a lot of industries where you can try stuff. You know, you, you know they, you to, if you're a giant winery, you can test market really, but no small miner can do that. And so, so you tend to do what's safe because of the giant investment. So, um, but, so there's maybe some education there in terms of what's possible. And, um, but, Probably the cons just the consumers in, in terms of a lot of consumers have been so conditioned that there aren't that many choices that they don't realize. I mean, when, like, again, when we get these wine, the wine tasters that come, nine out of ten or more have never heard of an orange wine. I mean, nine out of, nine out of um, probably 99 out of 100 have never heard of an orange wine. And there's like basic education. So like, so we, what we've learned is you start the, by the, um, description by explaining how rosé is made because the, most of the consumers don't know the difference between a white grape and a red grape and have no clue how rosé is made and then and so that you know it's a red grape red grape where you press it and from the juice away from the skins and then so the skin fermented white is a white grape fermented with the skins because the tannins come out of the skin like a tea bag and we explain that and then so this so people go aha so that's like kind of basic wine education but then it starts all of a sudden, if, if that spark is, is uh, ignited that, wow, there's stuff to discover in wine. It's not just the stuff I like that I'm just going to buy over and over again. Then they're off and running. You don't have to keep educating them. They self-educate. I really think it's, it's just getting sparks in folks. And if, it, if you can figure out how to do that, then that would open a lot of things up faster. And we'd have more ability to adapt to climate change with appropriate varieties as opposed to dumping water on non-drought tolerant, like growing Pinot Noir in Lodi. Doesn't make any sense except people want to pay for Pinot Noir or dumping pesticides on, you know, Vitus vinifera and Temecula when it's getting hammered with sharpshooters or, you know, or dumping insecticides in Napa because we're scared to death of virus moving around and so we can't get as ripe of cab, but maybe we could grow something else that we don't need to get, right? So, so there's a lot of reasons to educate the consumers to open up more, and I just think it's about that spark. I, that actually makes me want to ask you a question specifically. Do you think, so you're in sort of a niche market versus, you know, the larger producers, mm -hmm. and so you're not, 
you're obviously driving movements in some way, but then how does that translate? Do you think you play a role in terms of then translating that to the larger industry in terms of what's mass produced or produced yeah, on a um, larger scale? Do you think that it trickles down or do you think it can come the other way too? Or? Yeah, I think it does. I think, I think there is a role and I think, I'll give you an example. I was just at a um, wine shop the other day and I saw a 12% alcohol Riesling from Spring Mountain. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I don't recognize that brand, Kendall Jackson. So um, the big guys are, are paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I have um, a couple questions actually for, for both of you. So um, I know that, that root stocks are, I don't know, know too much about it, but I do know that root stocks are often selected by, by wine growers as, you know, for maybe a particular site or a particular variety and you know, to sort of uh, express the best sort of terroir at that place. So there's that. And then what you were talking about, Elizabeth, with you know, selecting those, having more biodiversity more, more diversity with those rootstocks to sort of uh, solve certain problems with climate change and with heat and all those and drought and those sorts of things. Do you think that those two things can, can coexist at the same time where we're like, you know, choosing something for, for taste and quality and for end product, but then also simultaneously choosing it for the solution to those problems? Well, so, I, so my sense is that rootstock is less translatable to the end product in terms of chemistry and quality and more. I mean, are you choosing, yeah. are you ever choosing a rootstock to match with a specific um, scion? Well, uh, um, yes. Okay. So, yeah, okay, so so basically, the, this, is the, this is the trick, because you're, there's this thing in viticulture, vine balance. You're looking for the vine to grow the right amount, not too much. And what limits it from growing too much is stress, mainly water deficit. Um, but, but so you try, so if you nail the vineyard design on that site, you have that means that you have chosen a rootstock and a scion that can just barely deal with that site. If they can't quite deal with it, now you set yourself up for water and fertilizer forever and problems. But if they they're too happy there, then the wine quality is out the window. So that's the, tr so that's the tricky part. That's why everyone doesn't just plant St. George and be done with it, because they're trying to, to, and so the safest thing from a wine quality standpoint is to err on the side of a little less vigor than you can have for the site and then get the rest of the way there with water. And, so, and then you can manage your vigor exactly. But, from a, but then you, a heat spell comes in and, you're, and you don't have a great root system. And you know, like that one in 2017, the vine was just kind of hanging by a thread because you've kind of put it there because you're looking for the top wine quality and then the wine just gets slammed by the heat. And so, so your wine quality suffers or you just pour the coals to it water-wise and hope that it's gonna make it through the heat spell. And so that's the, that's the problem. So I, I, I don't know how, I'm, I'm, so at our home vineyard, I've tried to, I tried something, so we have, um, for, for loamy soil, and so I plant this root stock called 1103P, which is a pretty vigorous, very deep rooted, and very uh, and, and a big root system, and a very long root flush period during the year, so that it just can handle just about anything. And um, it's our go-to in tough situations. It's not con it's considered a poor wine quality root stock in most situations, though, because it's too vigorous and it's a slower ripener and a, and um, and, you know, and if you're, you have herbal issues, like a, a variety like Cabernet or Cap Sauve or Cabernet Franc or something like that, you're gonna, it's going to exacerbate that. You don't have the depth. You don't have the mid palate. You don't have the tannin structure because it's kind of vigorous and it's not getting the right messages up from the roots to tell the plant to do that adaptation because it's kind of keeping everything pretty happy. So I decided with a great rootstock on a rocky hillside or like on really gnarly clay, the, the plants really suffer because the roots can't get down very deep and it's cracking and stuff. But I planted in nice soil and then the plan is that we are, we're planting California native grasses in between the rows that will hopefully compete enough that we get the vigor back down, but then we have the deep root system and the durability and, 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 and when my, our kids inherit the place and then in 
the weather is super hot, they, maybe they don't keep the native grasses in, maybe they go back to cultivating, or I'd rather not from a global warming standpoint, but they have options. So that, that's the idea. But jury's out on whether it's going to work because I can't think of a single viticulturist that wouldn't have said that it was crazy to plant 1103 in that site. So we haven't gotten hammered by these late season heat waves enough to change our thinking changing. that we still don't want to be hanging by a thread all season for so top, for top wine quality. You don't think not, that's not, not at, I'm talking ultra high end. Yeah. For more commodity, yes, it's changing. Yeah. But ultra high end, they're still looking for that hanging by a thread. And it, I guess I got to pre preface that I'm, talk, I'm trying to be in the top quarter of Napa, which is, and Napa Valley is 4% of the grapes in California. So you're getting a perspective of trying to achieve ultra high end. But in terms of disease resistance, or is there a lot of sought after? Oh yeah. Like so the, 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 is there, yeah. The new, there's a lot of excitement about the new GRN series. It just came out of Napa. But the problem is, um, everyone's like, are you, you going to try it first? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so we need, like, we need more, we need Gallo and, and just like the Candle Jackson, the places that have the ability to like put down demonstration plots and track data and share it and say, here's what this rootstock does. Because as a small farmer, you're kind of going, gee whiz, I don't want to make a 50 or 25 year investment on an unknown. So, you're, so, so it had, the adoption has been pretty slow on that one. Plus it was tough for the nurseries to figure out how to work with it, but they're getting there pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. Soil health is absolutely huge. I just didn't talk about it because we're talking about genetic diversity, but um, huge. And so, you know, so like when, when I've observed that just um, soil compaction, like, like soil compaction alone, your water use goes up so much. I mean, there's a lot of vineyards, if you can address soil compaction, you can, uh, you know, like our Linda Vista Chardonnay vineyard was a, we, 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 when we leased it, it had been, um, Farm, but you know, corporate vineyard for years and years. Beringer had, Beringer had it, and then Vino Farms had it, and you know, heavy equipment at all times of the year. And you know, we we deep ripped it and got cover crops going. And um, and within like probably four years, we were able to stop irrigating it. And so you know, dramatic, in that in that that site. But in all sites, it's dramatic. Yeah, completely. And you know, I, um, I'm trying to to use. Um, you know, more cover crop. You, you use compost. Compost would be great. Just put compost everywhere. That does wonders. But the problem is there isn't enough compost to go around if all the farmers started just put using it willy-nilly. So we try to use compost to, I call it priming the pump. And then we try to use our use cover crops more. And, and I really found that, that, the, that the, and then and changing your irrigation strategy, deeper, less frequent irrigations, and, and, and how you, you, you can for sure train the vines to use less water. Hey. Along those lines, one of the things is we're talking about native grasses and using those in the vineyards, which was uh, done a number of years ago in this region. Are you seeing any interest on the part of people asking for a regenerative approach as opposed to sustainable? You talked about a, mm -hmm. uh, a uh, in the market wine you're club. Yeah, in the market. Mm -hmm. You talked about a wine club that rejects anything that has residue in it. Yeah. And that's and so that's, so the, that's the new thinking is you believe I was just Googling so. regenerative yesterday to try to get a better sense of what everyone's talking about because I've been in my own bubble for a while. And I, I thought organic was included all that stuff in, in my mind philosophically. But I, I guess it's gotten so corporate that a lot of the consumer, consumers are saying, well, what are you doing more? I want wine that's done regeneratively. And unfortunately, sustainable was battling to market the concept, and then the Roundup, I think, I think Roundup is like the next ALAR scare, basically, is what's going on right now. 
And so that's just killed the sustainability movements because they allow Roundup. And so you can argue science. I, I, I'm, I'm a practitioner, so I, I can't even address the science on glyphosate. But I can, I can say that the consumers don't give a crap what the science is. They don't want it. And so, um, and so, so that was, it's been a real unfortunate thing that the sustainability movements, the sustainability certifications have lost a lot of credibility around the Roundup thing. There was an article that Esther Mobley at San Francisco Chronicle wrote a few months ago, really like calling that out. I, I did a long back and forth email interchange with her after that, basically trying to explain the genesis of the sustainability movements. That the reason they allow Roundup is we were trying to get them to stop using Simazine, Diuron, stuff that's a lot worse. And so it's like move to Roundup. We're no one was saying that it was wonderful, but it was a heck of a lot better than these soil mobile pre-emergence. But um, so she, that was good education that no one had actually told her. So the sustainable bully, it's been enough history now that they're not marketing like the concept of a progression of turning a battleship. And so I feel they've lost, at this point, I don't know how they're gonna recover from it. And so, so that, that's why these wine clubs are saying, look, I don't want greenwashing. I'm just going to test the stuff. It's only 80 bucks to run an agrochemical panel. So we're just going to start testing all our wines. And um, you know, I talked to some distributors after le learning about this wine club, and they said, oh, yeah, get ready. So. No, and where is that? Uh, down in San Benito County. What's the name of it? Hycenas Ranch. Oh, wow, I need to check into that. Yeah. Kelly Mobile. So it's basically like going like a grazed savanna kind of? Yeah. They're, they're not they pulling plows, they're just livestock. grazing? Yeah. And native grasses. Yeah. They're the big thing going on. Wow. Exists already. So. Yeah, the native grasses, we, but we were working with that down in Lodi, yeah. right? But. Um, they're just expensive and they're hard to establish and a pain in the butt, you know. But, um, you know, you could probably get, carbon-wise, there's easier to deal with grasses. You can get the same job done. For us, we want to use natives. It's a, more of an ethic. That's why you need cows. Yeah, yeah, because we're just using a flail mower. That's not as, that takes diesel. You know, we need a solar power, and, a.k.a. a cow. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, let's thank our speakers again.